So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on the 2020 National Carer Survey. Um, I'm Sarah Judd Lamb, the Manager of Policy and Research at Carers New South Wales, and I know many of you. Um, and my colleague Lucas Hofstader is presenting with me today. So we'll both be uh, alternating between the different slides we present. Um, and Lucas has done um, the majority of the, the real nitty gritty data collection and analysis of the, the CARA survey. Um, so before we get started today, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we are meeting on today. Um, many of you will be in different offices or at home in some cases um, and be on different lands. Lucas and myself, while on different screens, are both in our North Sydney office today, uh, which is on the land of the Gurrigal people of the Eora Nation. So we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging of the Gurrigal people. Um, and we also want to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are with us today. Um, and acknowledge that we did um, include Aboriginal carers in the development of this survey. Um, and that a number of uh, over 100 indeed, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander carers responded to the survey, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, so as you can see today, we are in um, a sort of normal Zoom meeting style where people can see other, other videos and things like that. I'm sure everyone's very used to Zoom now after months of um, COVID. Um, so just to um, flag, if you could please keep your microphone on mute um, while the presentation part of the session is happening. Um, if you have any comments or questions while the presentation parts are happening, if you could just put those in the chat, that would be great. Um, we will have a uh, Q&A sessions, <clears throat> excuse me, um, where um, people are welcome to use the raise hand function if they want to um, and, and actually ask a question um, and, and contribute to discussion. So we'll let you know when that happens. But um, yeah, if, while, while Lucas and myself is sort of going through some slides, if everyone could mute and, um, and just use the chat function, that would be appreciated. I uh, just also wanted to note as well that um, we are recording today's session uh, for uh, others to be able to check in later. So if anyone's um, concerned about that, um, feel free to turn your video off um, and just be aware of that um, when you're asking questions or contributing to discussion. We, uh, we as I mentioned, will have a couple of designated Q&A sessions through, throughout today and um, we've received a number of pre-submitted questions. So thank you for those that have um, sort of contributed those. Um, some will address in the actual slides that we've managed to prepare. Um, others we will use to sort of kick off our Q&A sessions. Um, not all were sort of specifically on the survey content and process. So um, while we were wrapping up at the end, um, I'll kind of address those briefly and talk about other ways that uh, people can be in touch with Carers New South Wales. So I think really the main, um, the main content to sort of speak you through today is that I will do a bit of an introduction of the, the session today and the Carers survey and its history. Um, and then Lucas is going to talk to the actual process of conducting the survey. We'll then have a bit of time for quick Q&A on the process of conducting the survey. Um, I know we have a mixed audience today. We have a, a number of researchers, but we also have a number of carers and people in between, service providers and peak representatives. So people's um, areas of interest will be different. Um, but that first Q&A will focus on um, the actual process of conducting the survey. So that might be a bit more technical. Um, from the researchers potentially. Um, we'll then go into uh, some slides on findings uh, and then have a, a Q&A session on findings after that, which we'll probably have more questions for from, from um, more participants. Um, we won't be able to probably get to all of your questions today, but if there's anything that doesn't get discussed, um, please do uh, note it in the chat or email us um, at the research email address and we're happy to talk to you um, another time about that. Um, and then I'll wrap up at the end and um, just talk a little bit more about next steps um, for the survey. So I will uh, get into the introduction in a second, but are there any pressing questions that people had about today's session or anything I've just mentioned? Okay, um, in that case, I'll do a bit of an intro. So. Um, most of you again will be familiar with Carers New South Wales. Most of you will have heard about this through our channels, but just to clarify that um, Carers New South Wales is the peak non-government organisation for family and friend carers in New South Wales. If you could go to the next slide, Lucas. 
Um, and when we talk about carers in relation to this survey and in relation to Carers New South Wales, we're talking about um, people that are supporting a family member or friend with a disability, living with a mental illness, with a drug or alcohol dependency, with a chronic condition, terminal illness, or who is frail. So we're not talking about paid care workers uh, or former volunteers or uh, people that might be called carers in the context of um, regular parenting responsibilities or foster care arrangements or kinship carers. So we're talking about family and friend carers of people that have specific care needs. And that's uh, more than 850,000 people in New South Wales. And unfortunately, uh, we, our survey doesn't, um, doesn't include every single carer in New South Wales or in Australia, but as you'll hear, we have a, a really, really good response rate and um, it's, it enables us to dig into information about carers nationally. So when we talk about the 2020 National Carer Survey, um, it may seem a little strange that a New South Wales organisation is doing a national survey. We'll explain the history of that. Um, and we'll also talk about our partners in the state and territory care associations. But very briefly, the 2020 National Carer Survey uh, is a survey that was conducted during April and June, uh, between April and June this year, um, which happened to coincide with the COVID lockdown, the first big COVID lockdown in Australia, which is very interesting timing, as you will hear from some of our findings. Um, so we had respondents from each state and territory, um, and it was delivered very importantly in partnership with the state and territory care associations that form part of the National Carer Network, um, of which we were a part. Um, and as in our previous surveys, we had an expert reference committee that included members from those associations, as well as carers and a number of uh, expert researchers in the field of carer research. And we uh, covered a number of different topics about carers in, from demographics to the caring relationship through to service experiences, um, employment and health and wellbeing. And we, a big thing um, that we always do in our survey, the Carers New South Wales survey, and that was carried through this time, is making sure that we distribute both online and hard copy versions of the survey so that we're inclusive of carers that may not be confident with or have good access to online services and information. Um, so again, to stress, we, it's not a representative survey. It's not um, equivalent to the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, survey of disability ageing and carers, which we would consider a more reliable source for population level figures. Um, but it does have a lot more in-depth questions about carer experience, including some qualitative questions. We could go to the next slide. So coming back to the question of why is Carers New South Wales doing a national survey? Um, the national survey this year was the first time that the, the biennial carer survey that's led by Carers New South Wales was conducted nationally. So um, the, the participation of the state and territory care associations and their partnership in delivering this nationally is something that's been considered and worked towards for a long time. So it was a great achievement this year on behalf of the network um, to, to re, re reach that na national scope. Um, but the, the history of the care survey really starts with um, the publication of Dedication, which was the report of, on a survey done in the 1970s, that essentially was the foundation for um, the establishment of Carers New South Wales. So Carers New South Wales was established on a survey in many ways, and um, has that, we've carried that tradition through um, in doing regular surveys of our membership um, from the beginning of the organisation and then from, from 2002, um, more formally and regularly of our membership, and then since 2012, with um, the uh, huge efforts of our prior senior research and development officer, Tim Brody, who I believe is online today, um, we really upped the rigour of that survey, um, was conducted on a biennial basis and um, had a real increase in um, topical focus and rigour over time with the input of an expert reference committee uh, and also with university ethics approval. And so from 2012 um, until uh, the last survey before 2020 in 2018. It was just a New South Wales survey, but it was broader than the Carers New South Wales membership. And over, over those years, we, we got roughly 2,000 responses each time. Um, and uh, the last survey in 2018, um, we got uh, about 1,800 responses from New South Wales. So this survey has been developing, there's been a lot of um, input and refinement in terms of the questions and the focus and the promotion. And then um, with the support of the State and Territory Carers Associations, we decided 2020 was the year to go national um, and to really apply that, those learnings on a national basis. A number of the State and Territory Carer Associations have been doing their own surveys in their own right. 
um, but given the, the sort of resources that we receive in New South Wales to conduct the survey and our background and expertise in that manner, it was decided we could lead that um, charge with the support of the state and territories. So um, acknowledging all of our partners in all the states and territories who've, um, been, who've contributed a lot to, to the uh, development and also the promotion of the survey. Um, so this, this slides today really speak to the summary report, which is um, a high level national survey, but we have produced data on all the states and territories individually, including New South Wales, and we're currently finalising a report specifically on New South Wales to compare to our prior reports. I won't go through all the, the partner investigators, but that's just a list of our um, partner investigators on our ethics application that went through Macquarie University. Um, and then if we can go to the next slide, we also had a number of um, unnamed investigator uh, partners that, who were stakeholders as well. Um, and importantly, we have two care representatives on the stakeholder, uh, on the expert reference committee that was, um, that was involved in co-developing the survey questions. Next one. Um, and just a, a quick mention, um, we, the last two surveys, so 2020 and 2018, we've done concurrent um, qualitative sub-studies for on hidden carer groups. Um, and we plan to uh, continue that into the future um, because there's certain groups of carers that probably we all know are very hard to reach and um, especially are not well represented uh, historically in the survey. And so in 2018, we did a focus group project with Cal carers, culturally and linguistically diverse carers. Um, and then in 2020, we did a concurrent qualitative project just in New South Wales with young carers. That report is separate and um, on the same page, same web page as the carer survey. So you're welcome to look at that for further detail. And before I hand over to Lucas, <clears throat> um, just to flag as well two key documents that you might like to consult after this uh, webinar, if you haven't already. Uh, the first one there is um, the hard copy questionnaire for the, the survey, which um, is something that, again, is very important to us to do a hard copy version of the survey, but is also a really great tool in understanding what data we collect, what's available. And so we often make that the first point of call for stakeholders that are seeking data um, from us because um, it just shows what we have collected, what we haven't collected. And it's a great, it's a great guide for understanding the survey findings. Um, the second image there is of the summary report that was launched in uh, Carers Week on the 11th of October this year. Um, and as I mentioned, that's a high level national summary report with um, some appendices for state and territory key results. Um, and so uh, again, anything in that report, if you have further questions about, you're welcome to contact Lucas or myself. Um, and we have put one fact sheet out uh, in NADOC week, which is the first of a series of cohort specific fact sheets uh, on different groups of carers. So the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander carers fact sheet is published already on the survey page and will be uh, progressing in the next few weeks before the end of the year with a number of other cohort specific fact sheets. So I think that's about it and um, I will hand over to Lucas um, and what we might do is, again, if you have specific questions, feel free to put them in the chat, but we'll wait until Lucas has finished this bit um, to then have a bit of an open discussion around um, process. So anyone that has questions about the background I've provided or specifically how we conducted the survey, we'll talk to in about uh, 10 minutes time. So um, over to you, Lucas. Okay. Hello and good morning from me. Um, we. So I'm going to speak to the process of, of survey design now, as Sarah said. Um, from the outset, the survey had 75 questions. So we narrowed it down from over 100 uh, with the goal to um, be able to um, fill it out in 15 to 25 minutes. Not everyone uh, who participated would have answered the 75 questions because some of them are specific on certain service systems, say aged care, NDAS, uh, mental health system and uh, of course only relevant questions would be answers. Um, the focus areas that structured the survey was um, were the caring relationship that includes information on the person being cared for. Uh, we included um, detailed information on a maximum of two care recipients per carer per survey um, but we of course recorded the number of, of, of people a carer cared for which could be higher. Um, the next um, bit in the survey is on the caring role. There are questions around um, what does this role look like, what uh, supports does the carer provide, um, how uh, has uh, the caring role affected relationships. 
Um, we then have a large uh, section on access and experiences uh, to services and support, uh, which covers aged care services, disability services, which mainly the NDIS, mental health services, GPs and hospitals, and services for carers. Um, sorry, I'm a bit um, letting people in all the time, so um, multitasking, not my strong suit. Um, the next uh, the next bit in the survey is on uh, are questions on paid work and employment and experiences that carers make in those spheres, including um, questions on um, what led to successfully finding a job or what uh, led to uh, unemployment. Um, these questions, of course, were only asked from carers who are actually in the labour force. Um, the next section uh, is on uh, health, well-being and social connectedness. Uh, and the final section is on financial well-being. Uh, all these, so the survey is designed and all, in all these sections, there's a mix of uh, descriptive questions about experiences. And on the other hand, we use a lot of standardized scales or survey tools, mainly the uh, personal well-being index, the Kessler um, uh, psychological distress, distress scale, sorry, the Hawthorne uh, friendship scale, and various instruments um, copied from the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, so that we can actually generate um, uh, comparative data to um, a population level. Uh, we also, and this is one of the strong suits of the survey, in my opinion, uh, create, um, collect a lot of qualitative data through open questions on relationships, experiences with services and supports, personal health, and there's a general um, anything else you want to tell us question at the end. And uh, every year I'm really uh, surprised how much use carers make uh, of these open questions to voice their concerns and to really get across um, what their experience is like. And that is really one of the treasure troves in terms of uh, data that this survey offers. Um, so the sampling strategy is based on self-identification as a carer. Um, we test that, of course, with selection questions. And the other uh, condition is that they must be living in Australia. Uh, we, we recruited this sample through uh, disseminating information to uh, the membership base of our associations and partner associations, through newsletters in online and print, through our social media channels, through our media releases, through all our stakeholder networks, uh, and we managed to put it in the field this year, as Sarah said before, between April, we had a bit of a uh, sort of soft launch because we didn't want to interfere with the launch of the Kira Gateway. So the launch happened during April uh, and the core field time was uh, from May till the 30th of June. Um, it was a Sarah set available online and in hard copy. And um, this year, to motivate more responses, we had an opt-in for a prize throw, and we um, uh, had an opt-in uh, option for linking the answers of this survey with any future survey that we are planning, which the next one will be in 2022. Um, from this stem, a few uh, limitations. Uh, firstly, it's not a random sample. Uh, it's heavily skewed towards more intensive caring roles and uh, carers who have long-term caring roles. Uh, so it's over-representing primary carers, high-intensity carers, and carers that have previously been in contact with one form or another of our services. Um, it is under-representing, on the other hand, hidden carers. Um, so carers whose caring roles are a bit more atypical, uh, on and off, um, who are more socially isolated, um, who don't see themselves as a carer uh, and carers who have not received services. Another limitation of this survey due to its length and due to the broad uh, aspect it's covering is that a high profic proficiency in English is required to fill it out. Um, we are aware of this. We haven't sort of, it's a question of resources uh, and a question of not just resources, but also methodological rigor uh, translation comes with all kinds of pitfalls and we just can't um, guarantee that it will actually make the data better. Um, of course, we have a response bias, like, uh, like every survey that is uh, self-motivated, which is that we, we are most likely to cover um, the more pronounced positive or negative experiences of carers. 
Uh, one issue is due to the length uh, and due to the technical um, surroundings with an online service that we do have quite a rate of incomplete responses, um, which sort of dropped out in data cleaning. And this year, um, one interesting aspect, um, on one hand a blessing, on the other hand a curse, is that it was, during, it was conducted during the first wave of the COVID-19 lockdowns that were nationwide and thus captured a very, very specific moment in time that created a lot of stress, not just for carers, but for everyone with a lot of, a lot of uncertainty. And um, I mean, this uncertainty hasn't gone away and this makes the data, if at all, even more relevant, but it is necessary to acknowledge the extraordinary circumstances under which this data was collected. In terms of responses, we had a great 8,000, almost 8,600 online responses, which boiled down to 7,735 valid responses nationwide, which I think is an actually great uh, turnout. Um, the majority uh, of responses was online, but still 18% of all valid responses came through paper, um, which is even more astounding considering that um, because of COVID, there were very little face-to-face -face contacts. Um, we distributed it to our stakeholder networks that includes hospitals, et cetera. But because everybody was, uh, because a lot of services were shut down, there just weren't as many face-to-face -face contacts. So the paper survey response rate is actually lower than expected. We do also allow former carers into the sample. Uh, it's roughly 7%. And 37% um, uh, of our response base are members of uh, care associations, um, which is um, down a bit compared to the New South Wales service of previous years. Yeah, that's um, so far everything uh, around the um, process. Um, are there any questions on this first bit? We have a, a question there, Lucas. How many people opted in to link data to future surveys? Um, that was a surprisingly uh, big amount. It was about 3,000 um, people nationwide who opted in uh, to the panel option, which is a great, uh, which is a great, great opportunity for the next survey. Great question. Any other questions? Hello. Um, a question. I notice you put up, um, there's, a, there's a subgroup of previous carers. Um, do we know whether most of those people are in, are in fact bereaved carers and probably care for somebody with, you know, an advanced illness um, like cancer, um, dementia and so forth? Um, I don't have the data here on that, unfortunately, but yes. Um, previous carers were asked why their caring role ended. Uh, we gave a, a variety of options. Um, and uh, bere sort of bereavement was, um, passing away of the, care, of the care recipient was one of the options. I'm just looking whether I can find the, um, whether I can find the actual answer, but um, unfortunately I can't, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I can look it up while Lucas is presenting the next bit and I'll pop it in the chat, Tim. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, if there are no more questions. We have one there from, um, actually we have two. Um, so one from Tim Matthew Brody. Um, any sense of how COVID might have affected recruitment, either online or paper, and were we able to collect any data specifically related to COVID? Um, so as I said, um, we assume that the lower paper response rate is in part due to people not engaging with services uh, where our survey would normally um, be distributed through. Um, people could order, we, we did send them, people were given the opportunity to order the uh, questionnaire in paper form from the webpage, but you know, once they're on the webpage, they might as well do it online. So um, uh, we do think that we lost a few there. Uh, and in terms of data specifically on COVID, um, we didn't know about it. And the, the questionnaire was finalized before the pandemic hit. So uh, there's no question what's your experience with COVID. But um, in the qualitative data, we see that a lot of uh, responses mentioned stresses due to uh, coronavirus, especially in terms of social isolation. And uh, I will get to this, the social isolation questions are, um, 
yeah, quite um, shocking. And um, yeah, I think that this was the most, uh, uh, this was the fact that most influenced by, um, by COVID together with the absence of services. We also, in a quick look through the poll data, we saw uh, many instances where carers told us that their services stopped um, providing uh, uh, either for, for themselves or for their care recipient, and therefore that increased their, their stress and their workload and uh, things like that. But we can't really quantify it. That's uh, in the college of data, as I said. Um, also add, we've, um, we've just done a bit of an analysis. So we did a, um, a search of all the kind of COVID related terms that we could find from all the qualitative questions and, and got a fair few um, quotes that actually refer to COVID or coronavirus or um, pandemic, those kinds of things. And so we've had an, uh, one of our team um, basically do some coding of that. So again, not asking specifically, but we're hoping to sort of publish that in some format as well, just to see what carers were saying specifically on that topic, especially in an open question at the end that sort of um, allowed people to comment on anything they wanted. So we've got some specific reference, but as I said, no, no questions on that specifically. Yeah, and what was it like for us to do this during COVID? Um, yeah, like like for everyone, um, cooped up at home, um, refreshing the ticker. How many, how many answered online? Um, no, um, it worked quite well in the end, I think. And um, of course, we were dealing like everybody with the disruptions of our regular work schedules and um, you know um, how we would usually work. But um, yeah. I think the, the the biggest impact was really on the data collected and on uh, yeah on simply the fact that it was a very disruptive time for everyone, especially for carers in long term and high intensity caring roles who are reliant on supports. And I think that really comes out in especially in the call data. And it didn't seem to to you know suppress the response rate. And in the in the young carer sub study that we did alongside the survey around the similar timing, um, which was relying on it was originally going to be a bunch of focus groups with young carers, which obviously didn't go ahead in April, May, um, and ended up being uh, you know Zoom interviews. And we we thought we would have significantly lower response than we um, wanted, but we actually had a huge response. So it was really interesting to see that the response rates actually kind of went up potentially. There was a lot of engagement, which we were surprised about, I guess, because everyone was at home and online. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was very interesting. Cool. Um, Thanks, Michelle. Maybe continue with the next bit, which is on the findings. And for, to, to start off with the findings, um, we decided to start off with one of the uh, pre-formulated questions that we collected in, in registration because this is sort of at the heart of the matter, is the question, um, what do carers need and what do carers want? Um, there's one question on carer supports. We start off with that. Um, so what we clearly see here is um, the kind of supports that um, carers use in blue and the supports that carers want. And there's kind of a theme that I wanna get started here which is the real, the need for face-to-face -face interaction, face-to-face -face services. Um, so what becomes clear from this is carers have a huge unmet need of supports. I think that part of it was due to COVID, um, but every survey more or less discovers that there's an unmet need. But what we find especially uh, interesting in, in, in this respect is that the need for face-to-face -face and the the wish to be uh, in contact with someone in person rather than online seems to really um, come out uh, in this question. And that's something that sort of the, the desire for human contact, if you will, is something that really flows through um, the results uh, in a very um, interesting way. So if we start off more generally, um, the typical respondent to our survey was a female primary carer, aged 58.1, I think, um, on average, uh, with a high school education, but not participating in paid employment. This speaks to sort of the still big issue that is um, combining care and work, especially for high intensity care roles. Uh, the typical person being cared for was an adult son with a physical disability, 
who's not able to be left alone for more than a few hours. Um, these are sort of the, the, the two poles between uh, where, uh, that speak for the majority of our, of our sample. However, our sample was a lot more diverse than just that. So we did manage to cover uh, every state and territory in sufficient numbers and also um, urban, regional and remote areas in a, in a really sort of broad way. We don't have that many very remote carers, but then there are not that many people living very remotely in Australia. Um, most respondents were caring for one person and most respondents had no assistance. Um, one in four was caring for more than one person. Um, and the person most likely cared for was a child, including an adult child or partners. That were the most frequent um, relationships in the care recipient. Uh, most provided 40 or more hours per care per week, and uh, more than half had been caring for, for 20 years or more. Um, in more detail, uh, here's a table on uh, the demogra demography of our respondents. 93.2% uh, um, were primary carers who answered. Um, Roughly a third was, uh, uh, well, more than a third was uh, age 65 or older. Uh, and um, this year we managed to get quite a bit of a number of under 24 year old carers, which was really a great achievement. Um, education wise, uh, it, it lumps around high school education or lower than high school. And um, we had 35% employed carers, which is a really good response. They were also, they are also very often hard to reach and 8.6% um, unemployed carers, and 55.7% who are not in the labor force. 34% of our respondents had a uh, disability themselves or a chronic condition. And to the right, to the right most, you see the uh, equivalent values from the ASTEC 2018, which is sort of the estimate for the uh, population. And um, yeah, so this makes it clear that we clearly, that we do have a, uh, uh, we do have a, a focus on, on high intensity and long-term care roles in our survey. Uh, in terms of diversity, um, the majority were of Australian uh, cultural background or um, answer to the cultural background question that they were Australian and something else like Australian Italian. Uh, we had 142 Aboriginal uh, or Torres Strait Islander carers um, and we had 340 carers who identified as something other than Australian culturally. Uh, we had 196 um, uh, LGBTQI uh, plus carers, which is a really great response from that cohort. And um, we will say a few things uh, about that later. Uh, in terms of um, geographical distribution, as I said, we managed to get someone from every uh, state and territory. Uh, the bigger states uh, got, the bigger, got the bigger amount of responses, which is clear, it, it lumps like the population along the eastern seaboard. Um, we have a very good split between major cities, uh, inner regional and outer regional um, uh, carers, uh, which is really, uh, which gives really a broad depth and a broad insight into how, how the access to service, services differ and how experiences differ uh, along these lines. Um, in terms of service used by those who, care, who are cared for, um, the majority were either in, um, uh, disability services or mental health services uh, and 32% uh, were in aged care services. So they don't really add up. So it was of course possible that one care recipient was taking part in, in more than one uh, care system. Um, in terms of results, um, it was quite interesting to see that most carers on the one hand feel well informed by aged care services and GPs, but not by hospitals and other services. The majority of carers reported that they were not asked about their needs, um, which is sort of something that carries through from previous years. Uh, and that is true for all service types. And um, aged care services were the only service where a majority said that having aged care services for the person they care for allowed them to stay in work. Uh, for all other, um, all other um, service types, um, uh, respondents disagreed with that notion. Um, what was fairly consistent across the service types was also that one of the main uh, one of the main problems was to actually find information about available services and uh, and uh, opportunities to access. So while once in the service, the information they felt relatively okay informed, um, 
getting there and navigating the information to get a service, especially for NDIS and HK, was a main challenge. The other main challenge that we know uh, was a long waiting times for assessments, long waiting time for access throughout all service types, especially mental health, NDIS, aged care. Um, this was in all service types more than a third. Uh, and um, the other big challenge was the time and energy it takes to organize these services. This was really something that uh, came out, not just in the, in the quantitative uh, answers, but also in the qualitative data uh, something that was described very uh, intensely. If you look about, I look at the care inclusion health services. So, just because we, if we have time, we can go through the other service types as well in more detail. But for, for health services, this is a typical picture. So, um, most carers aren't asked about their own needs, neither by the GP nor by the hospital. Um, however, uh, the information provided was um, often very. Um, uh, so carers thought they were provided with the necessary information. Um, interestingly, also hospitals don't get best marks on providing sufficient support options and facilities for carers. This is something that uh, also clearly came out. Um, one main aspect of the survey was, as I said, uh, health and well-being. Um, the shocking but unsurprising uh, uh, result is that nearly half of all carers who responded have high or very high rates of psychological distress. There's an increase and, uh, from two years ago, and we assume that this has a lot to do with uh, COVID. Um, the other really shocking result was that one third of respondents felt highly isolated. And um, as usual, care of well-being as a result is um, uh, a lot lower than the general population. Um, most respondents felt that their family members and friends recognized and valued their caring role, um, but less than one in five felt recognized and valued by the government or the general community. Um, if you look at well-being in more detail, um, we measure that predominantly through the personal well-being index, which comes in eight dimensions. Um, on the right, you see the difference in percentage points to the normative mean uh, for 2020 that is published by the uh, Australian Unity um, uh, Wellbeing Institute at Deakin University. Uh, and we clearly see that uh, satisfaction with personal relationships is something else I will speak about later, is one of the domains where um, carers really rate their own uh, subjective well-being uh, significantly lower than the average population. Um, similarly, um, achievements in life and the personal health. Um, so overall, um, there's a significant, um, significant negative impact of have, being a carer on the personal being. Um, and this is the other dimension that I wanted to talk about. Um, we measured um, social connectedness or social isolation through the Hawthorne Friendship Scale. The Hawthorne Friendship Scale allows for categorization in, in five categories from highly socially isolated to highly socially connected. And we see that the distribution of these categories among carers is, is inverse to what it looks like in the general population. So um, personal support, personal contacts outside uh, the relationship to the care recipient is something that clearly needs uh, more support and more improvement um, for carers and would have, yeah. Um, we assume that a lot of it, it was due to COVID-19, but um, the amount of social isolation with over a third is um, in, the, in the highest isolated category is uh, staggering. One other aspect that I would like to talk about um, is uh, financial well-being of carers. Uh, there has been a lot in the media recently about um, uh, studies showing that the cohort at the highest risk of homelessness in Australia is uh, women in retirement age. And we find a very, very similar and very, very worrying uh, picture among our respondents. 57.1% of respondents uh, reported a household income of less than $50,000 per year. That's lower than the half of the gross median income. Uh, we're still analyzing the data and income data is always very, uh, 
very cool. We need to be cautious about, about income estimates because there's a well-known uh, tendency to under to under or overestimate. Oh, I don't want to do. I want to delete it. Sorry. Um. He. Um. Uh, Seventy-six percent receive uh, income supports, um, which sort of fits the picture. And um, of those, so seventy-six percent receive income supports. Fifty-nine percent receive the care allowance. Twenty-four point three percent receive the care payment. 19.3% receive the age, age pension. It's possible to receive more than one uh, of these payments. <clears throat> and uh, what was really worrying, 50, more than half experienced at least one instance of financial stress in the last year. Um, and 14% are in acute uh, financial distress. That means more than four instances of financial stress. If you look at this uh, in a bit more detail by <clears throat> By the category of um, uh, of support payment received, so we see across all carers, it's 51%. Um, it's almost 51% who have no um, uh, uh, who have at least one experience of financial stress. Um, if people receive uh, a support payment, uh, the age pension the age pensioners are the ones with the least um, amount of financial stress. What is really worrying is that a, almost a third of those who receive the carer payment are in absolute financial distress with four or more uh, experiences of financial stress in the last year. Um, similar, of course, for job seeker, that that's inadequate is well known. Um, also very high uh, disability support pensions. Um, a few questions, uh, uh, to answer a few questions that were posed with the registration form. Um, have the number of male carers decreased or increased over the surveys? Uh, we can't compare it directly um, because we have a different sample this year nationally, but we see that, um, yes, our male respondents threat has increased. We are up to 18%. Uh, I would be careful interpreting this as something that men uh, provide more care than, than it used to be, although I think that's true, um, because we had a conscious recruitment drive for male carers because we wanted to, need to know more about them. So we approached men's sheds and other um, uh, men's carers association, for instance, um, to distribute a survey. Um, uh, overall, we know that male caring has been increasing from the ESTAC uh, population-wide, but, and that's worrying, uh, we know that in terms of economic distress, it's more the women that get pushed out of the workforce. And um, therefore, so the classic gendered uh, distribution of care as a female coded um, activity might get reinforced in the current recession. Um, Another question was about uh, LGBTQI carers and their experiences. And um, I'm happy to say that we are going to publish a fact sheet on LGBTQI carers soon. Um, we had, as I said, um, and, uh, 210 uh, LGBTQI carers in the survey. Uh, most care for a child or an adult child, uh, followed by caring for a parent rather than so the caring for a partner is lower in this cohort than on average. Um, the most uh, uh, significantly more LGBTQI carers care for someone who has uh, ill mental health uh, than other carers. And um, LGBTQI carers were worryingly high, highly isolated um, with two thirds feeling high levels of social isolation and loss of social support. 54.6% had um, high or very high levels of psychological distress, again, more than on average, and again, worse than on average um, well-being. 56% uh, felt that their caring was not recognized in the community compared to 44.6% among non-LGBTQI carers. And this is really something that speaks for uh, the heteronormative care, uh, coding of caring roles, I think. That was a very rushed and very quick overview of some findings that we found interesting. Um, and we'd open up the floor for questions. So Sarah, would you like to take over the, um, the moderation again? 
Hi, Sarah. It's Carla from Illawarra Shalhaven Local Health District. Just a general question, and maybe Lucas or yourself. I know that when AHS was, or HM was doing the research for Department of Social Services back in 2015 for the for the Integrated Care Support Service, a lot of their survey questions were related to online focus and getting data in regards to that. And I just think, I wonder if there's a correlation to when you mentioned the biggest uh, need met for um, face-to-face. Do you think that there's, because so many things have been along the lines of um, services and support for online connection that there could be, um, a relationship there as far as the not having that face-to-face support because of economics or for whatever other reasons. Thanks, Carla. Lucas, do you want to jump in first and I might add something? Um, yeah. Um, so in terms of the Kira Gateway, um, only 13% uh, of the respondents to the survey have said that they heard of the Kira Gateway and used it. Mind you, it was April that the Care Gateway officially uh, launched. So that was really at the beginning. And so that's another good um, timing for this survey. It works as a benchmark for the state of care services at the beginning of Care Gateway. 42% uh, had heard of it, but not used it. Um, and 44% had not used it. Uh, in terms of online and um, Face to face, we clear. So we, as I showed before, um, the demand for or the the, the need for more um, face to face services is evident, um, and we also, but we also see that uh, the most the most used uh, service type was online forums or groups, then face to face support groups, and then uh, planned respite. So. Um, The face-to-face -face service types, with the, with the exception of, of, of support groups, are um, really at the at the lower end of the of of the uptake. And um, yeah, we need to yeah. Sorry, do you want to jump in? So it speaks to the need that, uh, on the other hand, sort of the face-to-face -face types are the ones that have the highest demand. So, Sarah, do you want to? Yeah, um, so I think we intentionally included a few questions on that topic, Carla. Um, obviously, the sort of policy environment shapes largely um, the topics that we're interested in finding out about. And um, with reference to the AHM um, survey, I always forget the thing as well. What we're referring to there, um, for those that aren't familiar, there was a survey conducted, I think, around 2015, 2016, that informed the development of the Care Gateway by a consultancy. Um, and there were a number of, of questions there around services, and that, that, that largely informed um, the, the online um, element of the Care Gateway development, noting that the Care Gateway does not only provide online services, but also in-person services um, as le released in 2020. Um, and I guess to add as well to what Lucas said, uh, the in-person services for the Gateway only started at the time that the survey was happening. Um, and also it was COVID lockdown. <laughs> so I think that in-person element was a bit delayed as well. Um, but the, the two main areas that we wanted to look at that in, um, if you uh, want to cross-reference with the report and the questionnaire, we looked at that question that uh, Lucas was referring to around um, use of and need for or, or desire to use more different service types. And we included um, intentionally included online and face-to-face -face versions of that. And so um, we were interested to see that the, the uptake of... Um, of online peer support was relatively high. Um, and so there's obviously this demand for that. And at the time, obviously it was lockdown time. So people were using those services um, in some times exclusively. Um, but we also included a question in there to try and get a bit more info about um, digital literacy and digital access than in the prior survey. Because in 2018, we tried to touch on that, but it didn't really, it wasn't nuanced enough to really understand where the, the pain points were with people's digital access. So in the, um, towards the, I think the end of the survey, if you find the exact spot, we asked about um, digital um, engagement and um, we looked at people's confidence. So we, the scale we included was um, one that we uh, sort of constructed and it was really around confidence using the internet in specific 
um, specific areas. So we wanted to look at people's confidence using um, the internet in service access as well as in finding information and connecting with others. So we did report on that and we saw that um, confidence, I don't have the figures in front of me, but can include them in the chat, um, that confidence in engaging with services online was lower um, than, for example, connecting with friends and family online. Um, and so I think that kind of gives us a sense of um, the proportions of people that really do prefer face-to-face. -face. Um, and we've, we've started tapping into those breakdowns based on different demographic groups. And it's quite interesting to have a look at that in detail. So um, we did a, um, well, I did a presentation recently for the Australian Rural and Remote Mental Health Conference where we uh, reported on digital access and literacy in rural and remote areas um, and drilled down into um, into that and um, that recording and the slides for that presentation are available on our website um, if you're interested in that but we, we definitely can and will look more closely at who those groups are that are um, have less confidence with accessing services online and I think it's kind of a plug as well for um, what I mentioned earlier which was we're very passionate about always having a hard copy option of the survey because we feel that a digital a digitally mediated survey will give a skewed impression of um, people's competence with digital service access and openness to that. And so I think, um, you know, we really hope that that's reflected and um, something that we'll look at when we're looking at in more depth at the digital literacy and access is um, splitting that by hard copy and online respondents. Interestingly, um, we, we were asked the question the other day as to whether, um, whether digital literacy varies um, between the hard copy and online respondents. And I don't think we've looked at that in depth yet for this survey, but certainly um, the measure that we had in 2018 uh, didn't really show that much difference between the people that con completed the survey online or in hard copy. And I think it's partly because we probably didn't ask the right question in that these days most people are engaging with online something in some way. Um, and um, I think really it's more around confidence and access. So we're sort of nutting that out a little bit more, but there's a lot, a lot there, I think, to dig into. So if people have specific research questions of that data, we're happy to look at that um, and, and find out whether there's any applications to support as well. Does that answer your question, Carla? Yes, thank you. I mean, it just again highlighted, I think, when I've had comments from other carers say it's like, you know, you go to a restaurant and you're relying on the menu as to what your options are. And given that, like you mentioned there about, you know, asking the right questions, it's the sort of questions as to then, um, is it meeting an agenda or is it actually meeting the need um, was, was part of the feedback that I have got from carers. Yeah, and one of the one of the key things that we wanted to embed um, in asking about the care gateway awareness and access, and in asking about um, the kinds of care support services that are currently accessed and needed, both face to face and online, we really wanted that to be um, established around the same time as the gateway started, and then we'll include those questions in future surveys, and then hopefully we'll get a sense of that um, whether that's meeting need over time. Um, so I think it's a really good um, it's a really good kind of starting point, um, understanding that level of awareness. Um, and then hopefully, you know, we don't know immediately, but hopefully over time, it'll, it'll be one of the ways that we can measure whether that's meeting need, especially the face-to-face -face component. Thank you. We've had a number of other questions in the chat, so I might go through in chronological order, so as to be fair. Um, we had a question from Tim Brody, um, whether we have any thoughts on state distribution, noting the over-representation from SA and TAS. Did you want to talk to that, Lucas? Yeah, that really has to do with community engagement on behalf of the Carer Association. So um, they were just very good in calling up their people and um, asking them to fill out the survey because they were really keen on getting a good response from their membership. Uh, their membership is very engaged and uh, other associations had a more trouble motivating their, their membership to, to fill out. Um, the survey. I think it, it really had to do with, um, yeah, a lot of other states um, didn't have the means to, to distrib distribute that survey widely. Also, um, New South Wales, uh, South Australia and Tasmania were the ones where the survey was actually included in hard copy form with, uh, with their newsletter, with their print newsletter, which not all other carer surveys, uh, all other carer um, uh, associations had access to or had the financial means to contribute to. So a lot of it has to do with this. It was the first time that we ran the survey nationally uh, and it was important for us to get every state and territory and that we achieved and I think um, with the data that we generate on a state level for those 
for those states, I think other states will see that it's really an important and good data source. Yeah, and I'd just like to add a couple of things to that as well. I think the other contributing factor, or sort of chicken and egg a little bit, is that um, Carers Tasmania, Carers South Australia and Carers Victoria were the representat representatives of the National Carer Network on the um, reference committee um, for the survey. So I think, um, you know, we didn't want to have every single state and territory added, added to that already very large group. So I think just having that additional kind of buy-in and, and contribution to the development of the survey questions um, and, you know, connection to that was, was part of it. But also um, a number of the state and territory associations, as I mentioned earlier, have, have their own history of conducting surveys and both Tasmania and um, South Australia have been very active in surveys within their jurisdictions. So they've they had their population sort of primed for engagement in that way. They've got channels to promote and um, they're regularly surveying their, their members. So um, I think there's a number of factors involved with that. Um, but I think our aim really, as, as Lucas said, was to get a national sample that, um, that really boosted the numbers that we had, especially in diverse groups, but also um, samples that at state and territory level would be helpful, including in New South Wales. And so while the distribution um, obviously doesn't, doesn't match population distribution across the states and territories. I think it's a, a great result. And if anything, um, very impressive from TAS especially, and to say to be punching above their weight like that population wise, they're thrilled with the response. So um, yeah, a big thanks to them for promoting the survey so well. Um, so G'day's got her hand up. Um, G'day, do you mind if I come back to you and just and uh, just catch up That's on the fine. questions first? Um, I can just see that there's a few here that have been waiting a while, um, but I'll come back to you. So um, from Angus, um, was there any qualitative data that could answer why LGBTQI plus carers were more isolated and less recognised in the general population? We haven't looked at that in detail, um, but I sort of the logic, the, the, the logic I assume is that what we generally know from the recognition of the caring role is that it is um, it is still very heteronormatively coded and uh, a lot of LGBTQI carers identify as carers themselves because they provide care, but are not recognized by others as carers because their form of relationship isn't necessarily recognized. So um, the other thing is that the LGBTQI cohort is a bit younger and is, uh, I think, overwhelmingly uh, still, still at work. And when there's this overlap of uh, role as a carer and paid employment. Uh, we know that employed carers generally also have their caring role less recognized because they're sort of perceived as, uh, as people who work. And um, it, it, it shifts a bit with age. So retired carers feel more recognized, interestingly. But uh, yes, um, that's our, our hunches to it. We didn't have a specific look at LGBTQI qual answers yet. I'm sorry. We have, um, we did for NAIDOC week when we put the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander fact sheet out, we had a bit of a look at the um, open ended questions from that cohort. And so we can do that with each cohort and have a look through. Broadly so far, I think the themes have been very similar. So I think we, we could look at that more closely. But as Lucas said, I think it, it, it probably has a lot to do with other factors that relate to um, those groups that experience exclusion for other reasons. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Lucas, but I think both in, in the 2018 data and in this data so far, um, when we're looking at um, sort of, I guess, for lack of a better term, target groups or groups with particular um, experiences and um, experiences of exclusion um, or uh, sort of less likely to identify as carers and access support. Um, we generally see all of those kind of indicators being worse in those groups and I think it's probably that that combination of disadvantage and multiple barriers to, um, to service access and things like that. So I think it's probably a very complicated thing but we definitely will um, as we're doing further analysis and, and kind of publications and things like that we will pull out some themes and some quotes that sort of maybe illustrate some of those findings. Um, and one of the, just to kind of speak to application of that, I suppose, there's a few things um, in the pipeline where we probably draw on that data. So um, one of our colleagues um, is currently doing a project um, on hidden carers from uh, LGBTQI plus communities. 
um, and that um, so we'll work with her to look at um, the the data and how that um, can shed light on that project. Um, we're also we've just started. In fact, I put something on LinkedIn this morning that some of you might have seen. Um, we're one of the organisations partnering with Acon at the moment on um, a project around LGBTQI plus um, palliative care, um, and so you know looking at some of how the, the um, findings will inform that um, will be another application. And um, we've also, now once we've got the fact sheet together, we had planned um, when we had our Strategic Carers Action Network meeting in November last year, um, focusing on LGBTQI plus carers, um, we had a number of other researchers present at that event and um, we're planning to touch base with them again with some other data sets um, that are focused on LGBTQI plus um, communities, but that have some carer data, and we're planning to kind of knock heads together and look at those, our data set, plus those two data sets, and um, that's New South Wales Health, and um, I think the, is it, I can't remember which organisation was auspicing the other, other survey, but we're wanting to kind of look at um, whether there's some common results among all of those. So there'll be definitely stay tuned for further publications and analysis on that topic. Um, and again, if you have any specific research questions that you want us to ask of the data, we're happy to look at that as well um, outside of sessions. Um, we next question we had here um, on the chat was from Paula Gleason. So um, when looking at the social isolation and connectedness, has the community data been updated for COVID? Um, because COVID seems confounding for this data. Yeah. As I said, uh, sadly, no. Um, not, not this particular indicator. We know that social isolation generally increased, of course. Uh, we know from the qualitative data that uh, a lot of carers felt more isolated due to COVID. But we also know, and this goes in the other direction, from our relationship questions, which were, so we asked um, an open question about how the caring role has affected relationships more generally. And we asked uh, relationship satisfaction for family relationships and friends. So how satisfied are you with the relationship with your uh, parents, with your partner, with your children and with your friends? Um, and what was really shocking was how low the relationship satisfaction in these, uh, in these uh, answers was. Uh, there's comparative data for the partner question from the HILDA survey. Um, I think in the HILDA survey, the average Australian uh, has a satisfaction of 82% with their, with their um, partner in, in their partnership. Um, it was really uh, barely over five for carers, except when the care recipient was uh, the partner. So um, what also came out in the qualitative response to the, to the relationship question was that the caring role seems to have a wide impact on the social capital of, net, of, of carers general and on relationship of carers general. And um, uh, it's not just that the diet of the care and care recipient uh, is uh, affected, uh, but even sort of in, in, in results, even stronger affected are the relationships to others. And um, we have sort of the, the qual data makes for a chilling read in terms of accounts of relationship and friends and family breakdowns around caring roles. And um, while I agree that a confounding factor surely is um, the COVID situation, uh, it is by no means the only one. And the call data points to a generally bigger problem uh, around, these, uh, around this area. If I can also add to that one, I think, um, and Paul will be aware of this, but others may not. Um, we did a literature review or a not a super, a quick review of um, the emerging data um, and findings from reports on COVID related studies um, in, uh, I think it was July. Um, and we're gonna do a follow up publication in the next month probably. Um, and uh, one of the key sources of data that we looked at with that from Australia was the um, Australian Bureau of Statistics surveys. I think they were doing fortnightly surveys on COVID and there was a number of things in there around um, well-being and mental health and there were also some care specific findings from that so um, if people haven't looked at that and would be interested in, to, in looking at the COVID household surveys it's worthwhile um, and I guess um, while as Lucas said you know while yes there'd be a confounding um, element um, on well-being of the population that potentially skews our care findings a bit further um, there I think there's enough 
COVID specific community data um, and enough COVID specific carer data to sort of compare those. But also um, because we had the 2018 carer survey, unfortunately we asked a different question about social connectedness in the prior New South Wales survey. So we can't directly compare results for the social connectedness question that we included this time, the friendship scale. But we did prior ask every, every two years the um, uh, uh, MSPSS, which I always forget the um, name of, but another another social connectedness scale, um, and we also asked well-being and, and distress. And I guess we can we can compare those results over time um, and uh, see that you know while things are worse, this survey, particularly with regards to distress and um, uh, potentially social connectedness, um, it's it's never been a good story. So I think. Um, you know, it, it, it's a logical narrative when you look at the data and compare it to the other COVID reports that have come out um, that, uh, you know, things have been bad for a long time and they've just gotten a lot worse during COVID. And I think most, um, most peaks and researchers that are engaged with disadvantaged groups would say the same thing, that the, the problems haven't really changed, they've just gotten more intense. And so I think, as Lucas said way earlier in the presentation, I think doing the survey um, during COVID without knowing that COVID was going to happen was both a blessing and a curse. I think it gives us a really useful snapshot um, of caring in COVID. Um, however, obviously, maybe... Um, you know, as a baseline, um, it's probably, you know, a, a bit worse than potentially what we would have been um, without COVID happening. So I hope that answers the question, Paula. Where we actually have specifically comparative data is from the ABS uh, COVID surveys on uh, distress. Uh, yep. So there is a population level data due, uh, from, uh, from the ABS during COVID and the distress was very, very high in the general population, but of course it was even higher uh, among uh, carers. Having said that, uh, it has also risen comparatively to 2018, but not as much as, as anticipated. So, um, and uh, well-being also is almost, is almost stable, but on a very low level. So, um, this, so COVID has clearly in, increased distress. It has slightly affected uh, well-being negatively, but um, the well-being, um, yeah, was so low previously that um, uh, there is hardly any any direct effect that, that's measurable. And um, I'm noting there's still some questions in the chat, chat which we will come back to, but um, I think uh, up next is Gadev. You had a hand up before. Did you want to ask a question? Hi there. Um, I was just wanting to, I was a bit interested in the, the, the response around uh, carers feeling that they weren't being recognised um, in the hospital setting and uh, they weren't being asked about their needs. Have you got any data that are we talking, I know you said that we're talking about primary carers and carers have been in that role for a long time. Is it around um, um, hospitalisation time or is it about outpatient support? Is it around their role with the care recipient's um, recovery or, or their treatments? Or is it about their own personal health and well-being that they don't feel they're being um, supported? Um, we do have quality data on that. Um, generally, it is more around sort of, we, we can't say when exactly. Generally, it is around being informed and being included in decisions made uh, in the treatment of the care recipient. Okay. Um, so it is, it, it is definitely in that context. Mm -hmm. um, and it is also, so in terms of being asked about one's own needs, um, that clearly doesn't work in hospitals. It works a bit better uh, among GPs, um, but also not great. It is, um, yeah. I mean, in both, in both settings, the focus clearly is on the care recipient usually, mm. um, but there's clearly a way to go to improve that. Mm. And a few other comments on that from a policy perspective, Gadev, as well. So I think um, one thing that I'm interested to look at more closely in the New South Wales data, because we've been, we asked this question last time, um, more or less, um, and um, looked at it on the LHD level. Um, because these are the national results, I think we haven't looked closely yet at whether New South Wales is 
much better or worse than other states and territories, but certainly in discussing the state and territory specific results with our other, our other partner organisations. Um, in certain states and territories, there's particular issues that have been identified around health services. Obviously, as you would know, they're managed differently in each state and territory. So I think um, the New South Wales report, which will be hopefully finished um, around early December, um, will give a better picture of New South Wales specifically in these areas. There is in the, in the um, summary report, um, there are some tables for New South Wales in the appendix, along with all the other states and territories, where there is a table uh, on, sorry, a um, chart on the uh, health care question that's on the slide for New South Wales. So have a look at that specifically. Um, but um, I think while we can't pinpoint where in the process, and obviously hospital is very generic, hospital is yeah. Yeah. anything, what we can, what we can do um, probably from early next year, once the New South Wales results are in, we can look at an LHD level. Um, once we've got those LHDs constructed, um, we can also look at um, a condition level to some extent. So I think that may narrow it down a little bit. Um, obviously, if it's, um, you know, carers of people with intellectual disability, for example, or if it's carers mm -hmm. of older people, that might give us a better idea of um, what kinds of services they're accessing. So I think if there's particular things you, you want to ask, again, we're very happy to do um, specific reports for LHDs or sort of specialist services. Well, I guess that will really inform the support, um, you know, the carer program coordinators in all the LHDs about how we're travelling. We, you know, over the course of the this um, year we're trying to get carers identified whenever a patient is being admitted into a hospital service so I guess it's just knowing are we beginning to identify carers assists in our registration systems and then at the ward level or in the outpatient level are those carers actually being involved in carers as partners in care so that's um, that's where the interest lies and you know we've got a statewide program can actually support some of that Definitely. gaps perhaps yeah We'll intend to include the same question again, like look at the same thing in 2022, and then we'll have, mm -hmm. I guess, from 2018 to 2022, has that changed in New South Wales mm -hmm. um, in any in any kind of clear way? And because we now have some of those people that have um, enabled their data to be linked, we yeah. can look at more closely 20 to 22, whether there's any change. So um, I think we'll be looking at that more closely and we will um, sort of provide probably supplementary report to the Ministry of Health around um, the, the health specific results because um, they're always of interest and health was one of our um, representatives, they called it mm. representative. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting data there for sure and um, even as well in the care recognition at government level, which is one of the questions as well. So um, yeah, plenty to look at, I think. Yeah, thank you. Great work. No worries, thanks. And going back to the chat, we've got millions of great questions coming in, which we knew would be the case. That's fantastic. Um, so from Michelle de Giacomo, um, is there any qualitative data that speaks to meanings or reasons for social connectedness and social isolation isolation findings? I think we've kind of covered that, Michelle, um, with the, the relationship stuff. Was was there any, any supplementary you wanted to ask around that? Oh, thank you. Okay, fantastic. So, um, then the, uh, and I should say, I'll touch on this later, but relationships is an area we are definitely going to do more analysis in. I think it's a really interesting um, body of evidence that we've got there. Um, so I think, yep, I think that's all our questions in the chat. Oh, wait, nope, we've got more. Uh, comments, comments, comments. Fantastic. Okay. So have I missed anybody's questions on findings or can we move on to sort of just a bit of a wrap up and addressing some of the pre-submitted questions around the policy side? Last chance. Okay. Not actual last chance. You can, of course, email us questions <laughs> anytime or give us a call. Um, so just, I guess, uh, to sort of bring it all to wrap up, and I think it's been some really useful discussion. As you can see, I think we have endless endless data and there's just so much we can ask of it um, you know with with um, Lucas and my limited time <laughs> um, but uh, we we have a number of ideas for where we want to dig deeper a number of our um, research partners are going to help us do that um, those that are named as partner investigators um, we will pretty much as always until the next survey is conducted be um, doing analysis because there's so much to do um, we'll be prioritising the New South Wales report, which is um, being finished soon, and the, the cohort-specific fact sheets, which we're also aiming to finish by the end of the year. And then we'll be looking into some, into some more depth um, from early next year. Um, before I kind of do a general wrap-up, 
we had a number of questions that kind of touched on, I guess, the implications of the findings as opposed to the findings themselves, which are probably a bit beyond Lucas's remit as the research person and probably more within my scope as looking at the policy application. So I'll kind of just run you through those and then speak generally to them. Um, and if people want to have more of a conversation about that outside of this forum, I'm very happy to follow up. So one, one question that we had that I think Lucas mentioned earlier was, um, you know, what, what were the, uh, what were carers saying they needed? Um, and I know we kind of looked at that specifically, um, and particularly in New South Wales was the question. So what are carers needing was really a question. Another one was um, how do carers that are not able to carry on anymore or, um, or you know, continue due to the, the challenges they're facing, mental, physical, social, financial health, how do they, what can they do to, to kind of cope? Um, Another one was about um, whether, what the future of respite services are and retreat type services. Um, so it wasn't really around the survey, it was more, you know, um, how can we prevent carers from burning out and what, what will that mean for respite services? Um, we had a question around how organisations and communities can best support young carers. Um, we had a question around, um, you know, wh whether there's gonna be more funding for things like seminars and conferences um, with the, the carer, support reforms and, um, and another kind of element about respite um, and how that in, in is included in the Care Gateway. And we also had a question around sort of 2021, what's planned? So that may sound like a lot, um, but I think uh, in terms of answering those in general, I think um, I'd really encourage everyone to have a look at the report um, more closely, in, especially in the areas of service provision. So um, we asked questions of um, disability services, Age care services, mental health services, health services, and carer support services. And we ask similar questions of each service system, um, trying to capture both the carer inclusion in the non carer specific service systems and um, the, the access barriers across all service systems. And we did try, as I mentioned to Carla before, to embed um, some kind of baseline questions around care gateway awareness and access and about, around um, just sort of the, the current. Um, the current landscape of carer support so that as that changes we can look at changing need. Um, I think there's a lot of the survey results as hopefully you've seen today can uh, tell us about what carers need. Um, I think uh, it confirms a lot of what we know but it also brings a lot of new information um, into the picture and I think um, particularly the areas that Lucas highlighted before of um, social connectedness and um, well-being um, and also particularly uh, relationships and finances are two areas that I think has have been less published on and I think we've got a lot of really great um, quantitative and qualitative evidence that we can use to dig into that. Um, and I think probably in terms of addressing those questions around, you know, what can carers do or what do they need, what, what um, are the implications of these findings for the reforming carer support system. Um, I guess just to give you an idea for how we use this data um, in, a, in a kind of service delivery and policy context. So um, the, the carer survey, and I should have mentioned this explicitly, explicitly before, I know it was on a slide, but I didn't, didn't speak to it. The carer survey um, is delivered as part of our peak funding um, as a peak organisation in New South Wales um, with the great support of the Department of Communities and Justice, uh, formerly FACTS. Um, and so it's a really, it's really essential part of our role as a peak organisation. Um, and it sits within our policy education and research unit. And so it's not done as standalone research. Um, we, you know, we work in partnership with a lot of different researchers and sector representatives and carers, and it's embedded in our systemic advocacy and our continuous improvement um, of services and also our delivery of education and training to carers. So it's a, a unique survey in its ability to be very thoroughly translated and disseminated in a number of ways. And so um, I guess rather than address those questions necessarily specifically, um, I would just say things like, um, you know, how do carers cope with, with burnout and emotional stress? Um, what's, how can we give carers a break? Um, you know, what do carers do when they're, they're financially stressed? How can we help young carers? I think we will definitely be turning to the survey results to answer those questions um, in terms of um, both looking at our own direct service offerings. So um, we deliver Care Gateway services in one region of New South Wales. Um, we also have a Young Carers Program. I mentioned the LGBTQI plus Hidden Carers Project. Um, so in the services that we deliver, 
directly to carers. Um, this data definitely will be shared with those staff, shared with the executive. Um, learnings from that will shape how we tailor those services um, and we'll look at you know, um, specific cohorts, specific regions to inform that service delivery. Um, also as the statewide peak and as a member of the National Carer Network, um, we do a lot of policy submissions and systemic advocacy to both state and federal governments around what carers need and we're often consulted on that basis. Um, we uh, definitely use and apply the data from the survey in all of those contexts and we've already actually sent a summary for our board yesterday. Um, we've already, uh, even though we only finished the report, only published the report in October, we've already done uh, six uh, conference presentations <laughs> with, um, with based on um, the data, which is quite a big output, I guess, in a short space of time, um, and also um, in a number of submissions. So we'll be advocating all those areas and the areas that we're raising the questions, respite, finances, wellbeing, um, that all of those things, I think, have strong findings in the survey. Um, and all of those things we are being very proactive about advocating for and have included questions that will touch on those areas to support our systemic advocacy. So um, I guess if people want to follow up with more specific questions, it's, they're probably best to um, email myself um, and we'll provide our contact details at the end um, and, and we can have a further conversation. Um, but yeah, really it's this data will be used for sort of research outputs, but also very much for our policy activities. Um, and so I guess um, in terms of uh, what initiatives are happening in 2021, um, so uh, we, we, as I mentioned, we've done the national high level report, we've done the, the, we're nearly completed the New South Wales high level report. We've assisted the states and territories, um, uh, you know, as much as they need in terms of their own reporting. Our focus, focus is obviously New South Wales um, and our resourcing is for New South Wales predominantly. So we um, are going to focus on that analysis and outputs predominantly, um, but um, other states and territories will be potentially publishing and, and using their own state and territory data as well. Um, we will uh, probably be from early next year dealing mainly with sort of specific topics and cohorts based on um, either papers that we're preparing on, on things that have come out of the survey that are of priority, um, responsive to requests as well um, for uh, policy submissions and systemic advocacy, and also a number of stakeholder requests. So um, we uh, have been taking and will continue to take research questions from um, our partners in the research, but also other stakeholders um, on data that would help them plan and improve their services. Um, we're always open to um, having those requests sent to us and um, we uh, will obviously have to prioritise. Um, so, you know, if you've, got, if you've got a request, give us a timeline. Um, we'll try our best to help um, respond to that. Um, and uh, yeah, then we'll obviously be starting to plan the 2022 <laughs> survey pretty soon, um, which always comes around very fast. Um, so we have a lot to, to look at. Um, as I mentioned, I think our priorities are gonna be um, relationships and financial financial hardship and poverty um, and social connectedness and well-being because those have really um, come out as massive issues during during COVID and in the survey as well. Um, so I think uh, we've got a few minutes left. So um, I guess in terms of um, just wrapping up, um, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. Um, we've had a great turnout in the end and we will, this is being recorded and we'll send the link around. Um, and um, we will also just, I'll put our, the research email in the chat for you, just so you have um, that for reference. Um, if you want to send anything to any questions to us about the survey, please send it there. Um, if there's policy questions as well, Lucas can forward that on from research um, inbox. Um, the uh, survey report and any other, any other, um, uh, oops, I sent that privately to Michelle. Sorry, Michelle. Um, um, any other uh, reports that relate to the survey, the Young Care Research Report, the fact sheets on the different cohorts are available at the um, survey webpage, which I'm just putting in the chat now. So um, have a look at that. And also, um, we'd really encourage you, if you haven't already, to sign up for our e-news. Um, we will be sending um, this afternoon, uh, after this session, we'll be sending through a sort of a bit of a wrap-up survey um, and email. So I'll include those links to the website um, and the newsletter in the in the email. So look out for that this afternoon. And also, if you could please do a little quick evaluation survey for us, that would be greatly appreciated. We're really trying to um, sort of build up our online 
um, delivery of these kinds of webinars and we'd love your feedback. Um, the link for that survey will be included in the email this afternoon. So if you can take a minute to, maybe two minutes to do that, that would be great. Um, and I think if I missed anything, Lucas, to wrap up. Yep. Fantastic. Thank so um, thanks a lot. And we look forward to being in touch and um, having more discussions about data, hopefully. Yes. We're always happy to share and I'm always happy to ask, uh, to answer uh, any questions you, have, you might have as much as possible. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.